The Unshackled Waves, episode 235. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, welcome to another Waves show. As you know, at The Unshackled, we aim to provide extensive and fair coverage of the Australian Patriot Movement. Given our current political climate, uh, Patriot activists find themselves the target of various government authorities and face criminal charges. The way our legal system is structured, a court case uh, drains a person of both time and financial resources, which makes it even more difficult to take on the power of the state. A man who has become known as the Patriot Lawyer and is helping Australia's two most well-known patriots, Blair Cottrell and Neil Erickson, in their current legal proceedings is John Bolton. He's retired from day-to-day -day legal practice, so has taken on these cases out of his own personal political convictions. He is my guest today to discuss these cases as well as his other activism. John, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Now, you're retired from standard legal practice now, but I wanted to get an idea during your legal career, what areas of law did you specialise in and did you deal with any politically charged cases? Well, my bread and butter was criminal law. I was in the police force for 17 and a half years before going to university. Quite late in life, started university at 35, no children, no degrees. Six years later, two children, two degrees. Uh, with a background in criminal law, which uh, was my foot in the door, uh, I went to the Crown Solicitors, Crown Solicitors Office, the Attorney General's Department of South Australia, just at the time when native title was coming in. And uh, in South Australia, there's obviously huge areas of, of uh, native title area, especially in the north of the state. And the old men and old women, to some extent, would not speak to the young female lawyers with the Attorney General, so they commandeered me. I was about oh, 43, wow. yeah, 43 years old to go and sit in the dirt. Um, and so that was highly politically charged and a lot of uh, angst. Uh, the pastoralists feared what was going to happen. The miners feared what was going to happen. There was a lot of scaremongering about people's backyards getting taken. Uh, I left the Crown Solicitor's Office and set up my own legal practice, practicing in family law, which is also highly charged emotionally, a lot of domestic violence, working for males and females. Uh, carried on with uh, Aboriginal native title matters. I acted for the whole of South Australian fishing industry. Uh, they had no policy of how to deal with native title at the time. So knowing it was politically charged, uh, I assisted them to set up the whole policies and we worked all that through. So, but my practice was an outer suburban inner country practice. Uh, and so I uh, wasn't really possible to get involved in politics. In fact, I speak to local businessmen now in that town and they say they agree with virtually everything I say, but they're too frightened to be not left wing because the left wingers will attack their businesses and uh, harm their business. And so this is, I think, one reason why uh, the polls and what you see in some of the media doesn't actually reflect what people are thinking. And that's why when it comes to election day and people can have a secret ballot, they can vote for what they really think instead of having to keep their mouth shut when they're down the pub. Yes, the, the left have become very effective and, and vocal in thinking that they are the, the majority and uh, businesses these days are easily intimidated. Now, uh, as I said in my introduction, you've become known as the, the Patriot Lawyer. Now, the Australian Patriot Movement, uh, there's a lot of public scuffles that, that go on with uh, them uh, and, and the left, and they, they don't have a good uh, reputation with the, the mainstream media. So it's fair to say that you're putting yourself out there uh, repre representing them. That hasn't deterred you at all? I've been number, was number two on the Antifa uh, for doxing at one stage. Uh, they, they're the ones that call me the go-to lawyer for extreme right-wingers in Australia, which, you know, as far as the left wing is concerned, anybody who is not left is extremist, you know, to the extent where the ABC and SBS, for instance, uh, as people are so used to left-wing views that if you even centre, which I say I am, uh, then you're 
painted as extreme right. And so, no, it definitely uh, doesn't stop me. But what motivates me more is this notion of freedom uh, and freedom of speech. And if someone, someone like me doesn't do what I'm doing, there is no one else who will say to people, and I only do two or three at a time because that's all I can afford to do in time, but I say to these people, you, my clients, and they give me the freedom to talk about it, okay? Normally a lawyer doesn't talk about their clients, and the people that we're going to talk about today have all given me consent, both verbal and written, to talk about their cases, otherwise I wouldn't do it. But I say to them, look, you're not going to get a big bill at the end of this from, it, from me, if we lose, you might get a fine and you might get court costs, but that's not going to be legal fees. And so it's always your choice as to whether you pull out. Now, if you take uh, Mr. Cottrell's matter, for instance, he's uh, charged effectively with causing people to think bad things about Muslims. That's the guts of the charge. He's not charged with his own thought crime, he's charged with causing other people, they use the word inciting, but that, dis that word itself is a disparaging term, isn't it? Because you don't incite people to go and donate to the Salvation Army or something. Incitement is a word that's designed to make you think that what you're being charged with is a bad thing, but effectively he's charged with causing people to think. This is outrageous. Yeah, it's a, it's a common thing these days to shut down freedom of speech that you could incite somebody to do something really horrific and so therefore you you can't uh, speak and we've we we've, we've seen that in in play uh, ever since the the Christchurch massacre. Well, with Christchurch, uh, I chose not to watch the live stream video. Uh, when it was available. And I'm pretty sure that any one of us could access it now if we hunted around on various pages. But I choose not to watch that. I can see no academic merit in me watching somebody murdering other people. I just, there's no point. But I did download the manifesto because I wanted to read it for myself. I wanted to find out what he said. Uh, I wanted to find out if what was being said about what he said was true. And it is clear when, and I'm not going to republish any of it through through your website right now. So, but he clearly intends to incite murder. He clearly writes who to target, how to kill them, what to do, how to go about it. Now, there seems to be a general consensus in Australia and Western civilization that that is not protected by free speech. You cannot, you cannot incite people to murder other people and say, oh, but I'm allowed to have free speech. Certainly not in Australia. Now, one of your first uh, Patriot clients was uh, Dan Evans. He was uh, attacked with, with golf clubs outside the, the Anarchist uh, bookshop in Newtown in Sydney. And bizarrely, initially, uh, he was uh, charged. Well, not just initially, but the police wouldn't withdraw it. Even when I told them, when I got on board and I visited the scene with Dan and his wife uh, and viewed the video, and the video is actually astonishing. You know, when a, yeah. client says, when a client says, hey, I was there, I was offering to shake this guy hand, guy's hand, and they said, you're Dan Evans, yeah. ran inside the shop then ran out with a golf club, a fluorescent tube, which they, a long fluorescent tube, which they smashed the end of and stabbed him in the back, attacked him with a pole. He was with another guy, uh, but they just came running out. And you sort of go, as a lawyer experienced and as a copper, you go that, oh, mate, what you're telling me can't be true. And then you see the video and it, it's actually true. And what's even more astonishing, this guy, Dan Evans, is sitting in the ambulance having his stitches seen to, and he's charged with riot and affray and assault simply for trying to stop himself from getting beaten up worse than he actually was. Well, the argument is it. always that it was provocative for him to, to go there, but you're entitled to, because it is a, a shop uh, where a lot of the, the Antifa in Sydney meet and, and plan things. And so he was, he, he was going there just to, you know, show that this is the place. And then they, they noticed him. And then uh, next thing you know, they've got, they've got golf clubs and are whacking him very severely. Uh, yeah, uh, look, the magistrate, when she dismissed the charges, made a short statement about political freedom in Australia and the right 
in fact, she described Dan Evans, this man was armed only with a camera and with words, and he's entitled to go anywhere, including to the political enemy's camp in Australia and not be physically assaulted. And did anything happen to the, the, the clubbers? Were, were they charged? My understanding is that they were also charged and uh, I haven't checked the files, but I'm informed and believe that they were acquitted because they were said that was self-defense. Now, mm. how that works out when they could have run inside, well, they did run inside and they could have locked the door and called the police instead of coming out with weapons. So it's difficult to actually understand how they escaped on that basis, but escaped they did. Yes. Oh, well, it was good that those ridiculous charges against Dan were dismissed, but it doesn't seem like justice was uh, completely uh, done. Uh, only four days before Senator Anning was attacked with a uh, bone, hit in the head with an egg in hand, and people can take or leave what Anning says. I personally disagree with what he said about Christchurch, but that doesn't matter. He's a senator of Australia who's hit from behind. First question is, what was security doing? The second question is, four days before that in the Queensland newspaper circulating in Fraser, in Fraser Anning's state said that uh, people are now entitled to assault as a matter of inalienable right uh, people who attend at the Yiannopoulos concert because uh, Yiannopoulos uh, had just been re-given of his visa before it's been taken away again. So we've got in mainstream Newsprint, the Courier Mail circulating in Brisbane and Queensland, printing a letter to say that these left wingers believe they have an inalienable right to assault people for a different political point of view. See, I think that's incitement. I think the paper ought to be charged. Yeah, I saw that and I couldn't believe that the newspaper thought that was fit to be published. And in terms of the Anning assault with the egg, I couldn't believe that because I watched it live and uh, uh, the people who were uh, restraining uh, Egg Boy, uh, which included Neil Erickson and, and Ricky Turner, like the police took forever to get there. I'm just thinking, where are they? I mean, uh, weren't they aware that this meeting was very politically charged and they seem uh, what else were they meant to do well this is a point that neil erickson makes in his case which is currently before the county court he's one of or three or four people who were charged who uh, were there to go to the yiannopoulos event uh, in order to make it a political event outside obviously the left wing had called for a violent uh, violent disruption and I, as I won't recite what was said in the Courier Mail, but they clearly have the attitude that they're entitled to be physically violent. And what happened here was Ericsson was walking along. Uh, I'm just coming, going to bring it into that police slow reaction thing. Ericsson was walking along and I've seen the video uh, and they shout out his name. There's, there's Neil Ericsson burst through the police, uh, stand in front of him. One of them does, slows him down while, while others gather. Now, the police say, uh, ultimately, that Neil overreacted and should have just um, done nothing until the police stepped in. Well, it was 31 seconds before the police actually stepped in. A lot can happen to a bloke when he's surrounded by people who think they have a, an inalienable right to assault you. Yeah, uh, I've been following the uh, the case uh, for nearly a year now, and that's how I first met you at the the magistrates court uh, when you were. It was another mention hearing, and now the the stage that the the case is at the the trial is set for around May or or June, around about that time. The file is just sitting there, but the date's not in my mind. But we are we are coming up for trial, and uh, the police won't pull out. Um, the, their position is that um, there's an overreaction and uh, that's the reason he's charged. Of course, the law is that you're not anybody's punching bag. You don't have to wait to be hit in order to have a preemptive defensive hit, if that's what you think. For instance, I'm an old man, I'm 65 years old. If a couple of kids uh, uh, came to me and I thought I was under going to be hit, well, I don't have to wait for them to hit me. And, um, because if they do, I'm going to lose. So de depending on the circumstances, though, and you're not allowed to stir people up in order to taunt them into attacking you so you can hit them either. So the, the law is very well decided. And so in Ericsson's case, it's clear that he's not the antagonist. 
on the video. He's walking along. You can see the video that these people are coming out and looking and waiting for him to come along. They call his name. They provoke the physicality. And uh, Neil clearly decided uh, that he wasn't going to be a punching bag. He defended himself and he defended others. And when the police stepped in, he stepped back. That's our case. Uh, the law is that it's a subjective, objective test that is provided Neil reasonably believed what he did was reasonably necessary and an ordinary person would not have been outrageously wrong in that belief, then the police can't prove the case. And one of the, the tricky points at the moment is obtaining video evidence uh, from the, 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 the prosecution. And uh, it's, as I mentioned, it's been a, a long process. There are initially five uh, defendants. It's now down to uh, two, uh, Neil and uh, Ricky Turner, who's represented separately. Um, but it's that video evidence that's sort of the, the key at the moment. Well, maybe and maybe not. Um, I don't want to give all my strategies away and I certainly don't want to seem to be uh, in contempt of court. Uh, but I've seen the video sufficiently. It's not bothering me in the slightest. I've had a uh, conversation with Neil about this. There is one more piece of evidence that I want, and that is uh, the John Saffron video. John Saffron was there with an independent news team and was very close to uh, the happenings, shall we say. And that is most likely, in my opinion, to be the best objective set of evidence because Saffron has a, um, a lot of experience at being at these events and uh, taking good uh, video and hopefully good sound. And that's what I want. And I won't be going to trial until I've seen that. But the rest of it doesn't matter to me. Oh, well, we'll keep following the, the case closely here at The Unshackled. It, it certainly will be one based on what you've said that will be an important one. Now, another patriot that you've mentioned that, uh, that you've defended was Nick Folks. He uh, was the leader of the, the Party for Freedom. He's taken uh, a back seat from activism now. He, he, he was always a very provocative uh, patriot. For example, he held a 10-year a anniversary barbecue at uh, Cronulla, so to give our audience a bit of an idea of what he was like. What did you represent him over? Well, just go back to that Cronulla thing. The local government, their council, and I think the police commissioner joined in in taking an injunction out against uh, Nick Fox from holding that 10 year anniversary in the place where he wanted to hold it in a park using council facilities. Now, I say the police should be using those very same powers to stop the extreme left wing standing outside the Yiannopoulos uh, concert, for instance. You know, they sent him a bill for $50,000, but they weren't policing the Yiannopoulos event. They were not inside policing that. They were outside policing the extremist left wing who were there, I say, with the attitude that's displayed in that letter to the Courier Mail. They believe they have an inalienable right to, to assault people. So I say that the police and local government used to, ought to be using the powers that they used against Nick Falks at Cronulla to stop these left wingers going there and being deliberately violent at, let's call them, not left wing events, right wing if you want to. And so I've, I've been with Nick Fox at a couple of places. I went out to uh, one of his demonstrations outside there at Penrith, it might have been, um, where they were converting a school into an Islamic school. And so I've, I've known Nick a bit. And look, all of these people that we're talking about, it shouldn't be a thought that I subscribe to their views. I subscribe to their right to state their views. And so when it came to the uh, same sex uh, marriage issue, Nick was on the side of it's OK to say no. And he was there at a demonstration and what he was saying. And, and Nick can push the margins. I push the margins. I was in Canberra saying it's OK to ridicule Islam. It's OK to do it five times a day if you've got time. If you can't ridicule a person who thinks that a man flew on a horse with wings up to heaven and back, and looked at a golden book as if you can't ridicule that sort of thing what can you ridicule so i'm okay with pushing the margins to the edge of the law but as i pointed out the uh, manifesto for christchurch i understand why the first gut reaction of the new zealand government for instance is to take it out of circulation because it does incite violent crime it does incite people to murder so i understand that so nick fox was at the demonstration somebody took issue they reported him to the tribunal the tribunal 
took the view that they couldn't settle it because the complainant was completely unreasonable. So they dismissed uh, the cause in front of them, which gave the complainant permission to go to the court, which he did. Uh, and Nick then contacted me, and it happened to be up here in Brisbane, and it was clear that it was left-wing belligerence, just extremist left-wing belligerence, uh, making outrageous claims and almost certainly going to lose. I pointed that out to the complainant. I pointed out what happened in the Queensland University of Technology when an outrageous complaint is made and subsequently found to be invalid and the court costs and legal fees. And I told them that my next step was going to be asked the court for an order for security of costs from them for about ten or $12,000 or they could withdraw. They chose to withdraw. Quite a wise decision, I'd say. Yeah, it's a good point that you make that if the the police and the, the authorities, they're going to place these restrictions on, on patriots, then at least apply them consistently to, to left-wing groups. I have been to many rallies which people would label like right wing. I don't like the right wing, left wing thing very much. I'm a deep green. I've built mud brick houses, grown vegetables for my children. I planted thousands of native trees. I say I'm a real green, not a greenie who yeah. uses environmentalism in, to, in order to intrude into other people's property rights, which is what the greenies do. So I don't really like the left wing right, but uh, dichotomy, I don't think it fits for, for the issue based politics, which I do. But I've been to lots of what people would call right wing things. I was at the first reclaim one where I stood back across the street before I could see that it wasn't going to be violent before I would be involved because I'm not going to be involved in violence. And I can say I've been to everyone, including Melton. I was out at Melton where the police horses were attacked by the left wing. They were not attacked by the right wing. Even the most, let's call them the most extreme of the right wingers who I chatted to, I spent a lot of time chatting to everybody who's there and the right wing have never ever caused the violence at anything that I've been at it's always been the left wing yeah I definitely agree with that it's been the same in my experience as well now probably the the biggest case that you've taken on is that of Blair Cottrell's now the the background is he was convicted under Victoria's Racial and Religious Tolerance Act for inciting serious contempt for Muslims. This was along with Neil Erickson and Christopher Shortest for a beheading stunt they performed in, in Bendigo in, in 2015. Now, uh, they were found guilty in September of 2017. Now, the, the case was actually brought forward by the Director of Public Prosecutions in Victoria. There was no actual complainant, and so it's been suspected for some time that uh, the, the DPP has had directives from people higher up. Well, there's a fair bit to unfold there. First of all, with respect to the importance of it, and if I forget about the DPP point, please remind me because I'll, I'll make a comment about that. It is possibly one of the most significant cases in the Western world, and by that I mean uh, America, Canada, Western Europe, UK certainly, Australia, New Zealand. It's a very, very significant case. Because the law, which you've uh, talked about, this particular section 25, almost completely reflects what Saudi Arabia pushed through as a motion in the United Nations. And uh, when Saudi Arabia, Pakistan and the Islamic states uh, were heading, chairing and dominating the United Nations Human Rights Council, they passed a, uh, an, a motion uh, that all member states of the United Nations ought to pass a law exactly like Victoria has. Our federal government refused. Even though it's a federal government that is a member of the United Nations, it refused to amend our Racial Discrimination Act from which Section 18C has become so famous about. But it did not put in a religious component into it. And we all know that religion is a matter of choice, where race is not a matter of choice, nor is uh, sex, nor is disability. That's why we have discrimination laws with respect to those. But we generally don't have, well, I was going to say we generally don't have discrimination laws with respect to religion, but, if, but of course we do. Uh, but Victoria is the worst example. And if you look at this particular section where uh, it is now an offence to cause people to think things you know severe ridicule is what is one of the things you're not allowed to cause other people to think if you look at ridicule what does that mean it means se severe severe 
bad thoughts. So he's charged with causing people to think severely severe bad thoughts about you know a class of people, namely Muslims, whatever that means. You know when uh, there's you know 1.6, depending on how, who measures it, billion Muslims in the world. Uh, go to any particular Muslim state, Yemen, for instance, where they're fighting each other, and each say the other's not Muslims. All five of the all five of the main Muslim sects um, have beheading as a penalty. And yet the prosecutor said on penalty in the magistrate's court that what these guys were trying to do was um, label all Muslims with the acts of a few terrorists. Well, it's not the acts of a few terrorists beheading people. So Saudi Arabia beheads 150 people every year, give or take. It goes between 137 to 160 every year. They did 37 in a three month period. Saudi Arabia has changed their definition of terrorism to include insulting the government. So when they say they're beheading terrorists, they're beheading very often political dissidents. And now we've got this bloody law, this bloody law in Victoria when our federal government refused to pass it. Now, you're challenging the constitutionality of this law. Australia doesn't have a, a right to free speech in its constitution. What we have is a implied right to political communication, which uh, the High Court found in the, the, the early 90s. How, how is that, uh, how are you applying that to, to this case? It's a long argument, and if I can be as short as I can, the High Court, since its inception in 1901, has said repeatedly that Australia's personal rights, Australian human rights, we start off not with a list of what they are, we start off with the inalienable right to do everything that an Australian citizen can conceive of doing. So if there's some new form of machine that I want to use or some new thing that nobody's ever thought of, I have a right to do it as an Australian until such time as a legitimate government uh, passes laws regulating it or preventing it. For instance, it's often said that um, a motor vehicle license is a privilege. That's simply wrong. It's a right. We have a right to use the public roads and public areas in Australia. It's a right. It's not a bureaucratic benefits. It's not for some politician to say, here's your driver's license, John Bolton, the wig. It's a privilege for you. Same with firearms. We have a right to own firearms in Australia. It's not a privilege to own a firearm. But as a democratic society, we elect government to regulate those things. And of course, we have to have regulations about what side of the road you, you're on. We have to have regulations about, well, we don't have to, but we do have regulations about not carrying a firearm into the local pub. And those things are regulated and our governments will change those laws if we influence them accordingly. But it doesn't change it from a right to a privilege just because it's regulated. So. It's the same with speech. We do have a right to free speech in Australia, and the High Court has said this. We have a right to speak freely. And wherever a state, federal or local government makes a law that infringes on that right to speak freely, then the courts are going to define it as narrowly as possible. So, it, oh, so the law will only just do the job that it's supposed to do and will minimise any impact on our right to free speech. When we talk about freedom of political discourse, the protection is even higher by the High Court because the High Court uh, rightly interprets that our constitution does not work unless we have the right to be informed. We cannot exercise our voting rights. We cannot exercise our participation in our democracy unless we're informed. And the High Court says political discourse can include invective and it can be insulting. And so uh, it's not a personal right, though. It's a right not to have laws which impact upon political discourse. Now, I say it's pretty clear when you say what could Blair Cottrell and, and the others do before this Victorian law was in place? 
the well. They could go out and say as much as they like politically with respect to Islam. They could point out all the bad things, you know, pointing out that Muslims behead people. Well, you go onto the internet and you type into your search engine Muslim beheadings and you'll come up with 250,000 different hits. So one more video is not adding much to it, especially when it's a dummy and not a real one. And there's bloody plenty of real ones. And I mean, I use the word bloody advisedly on there. You know, I think I've accidentally seen one. I choose not to watch them. I, you know, I don't need to see it. And it, when they set fire to the pilot, you know, in his orange suit inside a cage in the name of Islam. But anyway, um, that's an aside. So it's pretty clear that this Victorian law has impacted on these guys' uh, right to uh, political discourse and they're entitled to political discourse even though it's insulting or includes invective. So the next test is how should this law be interpreted? Is it a law for a proper purpose? Well, it may not be. It may not be a law for a proper purpose because a High Court has already said that laws which are intended to make people more cordial to each other are not valid laws with respect to free speech. You know, you can, if anybody who wants to look this up, they can see the full prepared argument on one of my blogs, blog site, wait, sorry, it's my only blog site, johnwbolton.weebly.com. You'll see, I've, I put the whole case up there if anybody wants to read it. So the next test then is if it does impact on free speech, and I say that it does, how much and what's the balance? I say it's way over the top, it's completely unnecessary. There are other parts of the Act which say, look, if you feel offended because of your religion, you can go to a tribunal, you can have a little bit of a chit chat, you can ha have a slap on the wrist or, you know, you can be told you shouldn't say that again. And that's the process by which you might want to educate people about not ridiculing Islam. Well, that's not going to stop me. I mean, it's a ridiculous thing. <laughs> you know, uh, what, the April, uh, angel Gabriel appeared to uh, an, an illiterate uh, Mm, warlord, pedophile, who's probably an epileptic as well in the Middle East and handed down the rules for mankind forever and ever. This is just insane stuff. So I'm not going to stop ridiculing it. I was saying to my old mum this morning, I'll probably end up in jail myself. <laughs> well, I hope not. Now, so far, the appeal, you were initially at the, the county court, they told you to go to the high court, then the, the high court uh, said, we can't hear it at this stage, and told you to go back to the county court where they're, they're going to hear the appeal, but they're still not sure whether they're the, the right people. It's strange that, isn't it? First of all, you have correctly recited that. I don't need to repeat that. You've got that spot on. And so we're now in the county court. In fact, yesterday... I posted out to all of the attorneys general, uh, federal, state and territories, advising them, giving them notice that the matter is in the county court. It is a constitutional matter. The county court, uh, sorry, the high court said in its decision that we had raised a constitutional matter. And so that's the matter that now the county court is going to have to hear as part of the trial. The, uh, the I, it's not, as I'm an officer of the court, so I uh, won't be disparaging any uh, judicial officers, but it's the question of convincing the judges in the county court when it comes up for trial that it's in their jurisdiction. The High Court said so. The uh, prosecution, the Attorney General of Victoria said to the High Court that the county court has jurisdiction, and it was my initial belief that it did have, which is why I lodged the notice of constitutional matter in the county court in the first place. Now, obviously, challenging the, the constitutionality of a, a law, it's, it's quite a, a big uh, thing to, to take on as a, as a lawyer. So the, this battle, it hasn't daunted you at all? It does daunt me. It da daunts me because of the responsibility for the outcomes. Um, and I, I've been involved in training young lawyers and also uh, people involved with the government. And it's, it's a very heavy burden. I've been to the High Court once before. Um, I took a matter where a, uh, a person was uh, unfairly uh, contracted out of her, her inheritance. The law was against me. Um, everybody was telling me the law was against me, but I believed that High Court would act in equity and interfere with the strict law, and it did. And so I was instrumental in changing the law with respect to inheritances um, through the High Court. That's the only time I've been there. 
and was successful. But if you can imagine this, if we lose this case, that's the end of free speech in Australia. I, I've sort of accepted that there's not much uh, free speech uh, in, in Australia, but if you can definitely help change that, it'll, it'll, it'll certainly be a, a monumentous development. Just chatting broadly, when I uh, spoke at the Pegida rally in Canberra, uh, out, out the front of Parliament House, and again, the, the, the right wingers do everything correctly. You know, I, I drafted a letter to go to the Speaker of the Parliament House, who's in charge of security, to the uh, the, the police forces in, in the ACT to advise them that we we're going to have this meeting. The left wing don't seem to bother. They just seem to turn up and go inside the Parliament House, climb all over it. Nothing much seems to happen to them, whereas we try to comply with the law. Um, but outside there, I was saying it, it was specifically with respect to the uh, what was going on in Europe and the Islamic assaults that occurred right through Europe on New Year's Eve and all those sorts of things. So it was an Islam focus. And I don't want you to think that's the only thing I do. I, I do lots of things, Aboriginal rights, uh, uh, domestic violence, um, all, all, you'll see from my web page. There's about six or seven topics I do. But with respect to Islam, it seems to be the most one of the most fiery responses Responses. And of course, you know, if someone threatens you with death because you're speaking against Islam, there's a, a great track record for that threat being followed through. And so you have to be uh, serious ab about uh, about threats. And I, and I have been uh, woken up with a gunshot. I've been told that I'm going to be killed. Um, I report these things to, to the police. In fact, the night I was uh, woken by a gunshot about two o'clock in the morning, I thought I was dreaming uh, oh. and I just dismissed it from my mind until the next morning I found an empty rifle shell in my driveway. Yeah, they, that, there you go. Pretty scary. Yeah, so for the, uh, from that night onwards, I took, for a period of time, I slept in a different room, sort of no more than two nights in a row did I sleep in the same room and I made sure I didn't have the light on or the curtains open, <laughs> just, you know. Um, that's a serious threat yeah. on top of actually being emailed or a message that uh, how about if I blow you up? How about if I shoot you? How's that for your free speech? That sort of thing. It comes with the territory, I guess. So when I spoke in Canberra, there was a complaint made to the Law Society of South Australia that I wasn't a fit and proper person and I ought to be struck from the role of, uh, of the of barristers in South Australia. So that's how they fight. And at the time, what I said was not unlawful in the ACT. They have now changed the law in the ACT, so it's even worse than the Victorian law. And if I went back and said exactly what I said last time, again, I'd be breaching the Australian Capital Territory law. Well, post Christchurch, all, all the talk that we've heard is that we need to regulate the hate speech and, and racism, that they are a threat to, to our democracy. And of course, there's been talk that uh, MPs or senators who speak hate speech should be expelled from parliament, which is a, a pretty uh, draconian subversion of, of democracy in its true form. Well, of course, Senator Penny Wong, in the say no to same sex marriage debate, said that people who opposed it were hate speeches. Just opposing what she wanted to push through was hate speech. So who's going to define what hate speech is? Who's going to say what you can and can't say? Mm. In, in New Zealand, it is the chief censor. Now, who would you trust? Because free speech is not just about what you can say. There's the other side of the coin. It's about what you can hear. Who do you trust to stop you from hearing things? Who would you put in the place of saying that you cannot, as a political commentator, you cannot read the Christchurch Manifesto? It's true that it incites violence. It's not going to incite me to go blowing up people or bombing people. And I doubt whether it incite you. But I think it has to be admitted that it might well incite some people. But of course, the Quran does that. You know, 165 places where the Quran calls for beheading and all sorts of other things for people. And we give that to prisoners in Australian jails who've been convicted of Islamic violence. And we give them the very book that incites them to do it. So if we're going to stop people from reading the Christchurch Manifesto, we ought to stop giving the Quran to Islamic terrorist prisoners, I say. 
Yeah, that's certainly a legitimate point. Now, I want to move on to your other um, political activism. You're involved with a lobby group called uh, Right On, which is it's one of the, the many activist groups that are trying to counter the influence of Get Up. Now, they're based up in, in Queensland. What type of activism have they engaged in and has it has it been effective obviously we've got a, a federal election coming up so that'll be a, a a big test first thing i'll point out tim is that it's not the only political activist group i do work for and work for uh, and i'm not on their board and i don't uh, speak for them except from time to time i've asked to be the spokesman i know i am their legal advisor so they run things past me like the how to vote cards they put out whether they comply with the act and and whether or not some of the things they put out and say about get up and its association with the international extreme left winger socialist george soros and those sorts of things so uh, obviously the, the things that i say i i intend to uh I intend to be inside the law and every group that i work with needs to give that undertaking as well so um do you, would you like to ask me a specific question about them because i can talk about them a lot and i could talk about safer i could talk about communities sa i could talk about pegida uh, get uh, uh, reclaim australia all those sorts of groups are doing some really good things i think they issued uh, confidentially to uh, members and advisors what their strategy is going to be for this federal election and it is confidential and I haven't read it before I came uh, on your show today just in case I let it slip but mm -hmm. I, you, I can tell you exactly what they did in the Queensland election which was save three state seats because because there was this fiasco where one nation uh, at the last moment put out how to vote cards which put Labour above uh, Liberal National Parties and the Labour people were literally gleeful. I mean, I, I was around and I, and I stood polling, pre-polling and all those sorts of things. My contacts and the people I contact, we have contacts with all of the Conservative parties. So, you know, we're on speaking terms with many of the players, uh, many of the main players as well. And so we knew that a number of One Nation candidates were horrified and refused or didn't want to hand out their own cards, which put Labour of a LMP and they knew their members didn't. They had volunteers were walking away from volunteering to hand out One Nation cards wow. because they were right. So we had about 14 days, when I say we, I mean right on and we had, had these think tanks. And so uh, they, they issued two-sided how to vote cards. And I said, look, I think I should, I want to target one particular electorate because we've got a limited manpower, person power, and a limited uh, funds. So if we're going to make a difference, let's make. So we targeted Glasshouse Mountains. Andrew Powers was, and it remains, a sitting LMP member. That flow, flowed over to Caloundra and to Toowoomba North, and there's one other seat as well, which I forget. But the, the strategy was, um, and I flew people up from Adelaide and Sydney to join because we needed that critical mass in Glasshouse. There was no point in going there unless we could get more than half of the voters to, to receive our how to, get, how to vote cards. So we printed two sided how to vote cards, how to vote LMP on one side uh, with One Nation second, turn it over, how to put One Nation first and LMP second. These flies flew out of our hands. I've been standing polling booths, oh, I don't know, 10 years or something like that. And normally people are a bit reluctant. You get some, but so many people were saying, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to put the two conservative parties first. Now we uh, changed in glass houses, the outcome by about 5%, changed the preference flow. That saved Andrew Powell. We changed the preference flow in Caloundra. Uh, that saved, ooh, his name escapes me, I'm from South Australia. So we say, and, and Toowoomba North adopted that exact same strategy and they saved their sitting member as well. If that had been done across Queensland, there would now be a Liberal National government in Queensland instead of a Labour government. So that's why we did. We went down to Benelong when uh, John Alexander was uh, in the by-election down there at Benelong. Um, we maybe fell foul of the um, 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 dual Six, citizenship and that, yeah. Yeah, and had to restand and we, at that stage, it looked like Corey Bernardi's Australia uh, Party, uh, Australian Conservative Party, wasn't going to be preferencing anybody, and also looked like Fred Nile wasn't going to be preferencing anybody. And between the two of them, they could have got 14 or 15 percent, which might not have been being directed. So we had a how, to, how to vote cards printed there to ensure that all the Conservative votes were harvested to a major Conservative Party. We, I don't care. Right on doesn't care. 
which Conservative Party gets home. You know, the reason we didn't go into New South Wales because the farmers, fishers uh, and shooters looked like they were going to take LNP seats doesn't matter to us. They're, they're a Conservative Party that are home. I know it's going to make nominally the LNP uh, more difficult to run the state, but these are Conservative winners and that's, that's all we're out to do. So I went down to Benelon with these how to vote cards. By the time I got there and called into the uh, LNP and rechecked all the most recent how to vote cards they were, preferencing the way we wanted them, I went outside of the bin and put $500 worth of how to vote cards into the bin because we didn't want to confuse the election. That's yeah. what we do. It's interesting that you've talked about that because we're, we've just seen Scott Morrison say that the Liberal Party will put One Nation uh, below the, the Labour Party and Pauline Hanson's come out and called him a fool saying you've basically handed the keys to the Lodge to Labour and the Greens, which might make that strategy that you've outlined a, a bit more important. Many people uh, view uh, Pauline Hanson in different ways and she's matured immensely, of course, since she first stood. Her policies have matured, uh, what she says about them, you know, Mark Latham, I was a bit surprised when he joined forces with her, he's obviously a senator now in New South Wales, uh, but he speaks really well. I've been to, I went to two meetings in Sydney in the week leading up to the New South Wales elections to see whether we could do anything there. I spoke with a few people and the only thing that people, uh, conservatives were concerned about in the Liberals Party would really was that farmers, uh, fishers and shooters would take some seats from other Conservatives. Now that to us, to me, is not a problem because um, it's Conservatives who, who are getting home and it's a harvesting the vote. And so I think Pauline Hanson is correct when she says you need to know who your enemy is. I, I responded to an article in the Australian, might have been yesterday, uh, when it said, you know, uh, by or some Liberal Party person, one nation is our enemy. No, it's not. Greens, mm, yeah. Greens, Phelps, Stegall, the unions, bloody, uh, these are the enemy of Western enlightened civilization. These are the neo-Marxists that are using the environment, using energy and global warming in order to intrude on people's property rights and to bring down the society that we have in order to create their Marxist utopia. They say these things. This is not John Bolton saying this. They say this thing. The Sally McManus is an outright communist. She says it. Now, you've mentioned briefly Get Up. Now, there, there's been a lot of conservative attempt to, to counter their influence at this federal election. They're throwing vast uh, resources and manpower at trying to unseat uh, Peter Dutton in, in Queensland and uh, Tony Abbott in Warringah. There was a, another group that was recently founded, uh, Advance Australia, which uh, uh, they had a started with a big advertising campaign, but there's I haven't heard much from them uh, since. It seems that with Get Up, it's you're almost up against some sort of progressive monster who can just throw endless resources at trying to defeat uh, conservative and right wing um, politicians. Well, the, again, uh, quite a lot in there, uh, Tim. First of all, uh, Advance Australia has tapped into reasonably substantial funds. And from what I've seen they're doing in Warringah, some of the signs they're doing there, they're doing a great job at the level that they're working at. They've got trucks with big signs on that are, you know, really ridiculing Stegall for having never voted Liberal in 20 years. And, you know, with respect to Get Up being a monster, the thing is about being an enlightened modernist as opposed to a postmodernist is we have facts. We use facts and reason. And whenever you use facts and reason, the left wing just become angry. They become angry and insulting. And uh, this is the weapon that we have that they don't have. Uh, you're involved in a couple of other uh, activist groups, uh, Security and Freedom Australia. What do, what do they do? Well, they've just come out with a great survey. There, there's two previous service being, uh, surveys been published in, with respect to Islamophobia in Australia. South Australian University, sorry, University of South Australia, headed by uh, a Muslim, has its own uh, Islamic faculty. 
Yes. You know, South, like, why would a university in South Australia need an Islamic faculty? And then, of course, you've got Griffith University who've picked up the so-called Islamophobia register, which is self-reporting. So if you're a person who has been wearing a Sharia compliant headdress and somebody looks at you differently on the bus going to work, you can report that. And that becomes an event for Islamophobia. So they report all these things. So SAFER decided they would like to uh, um, survey, not being a survey that's conducted for Muslims, by Muslims, about Muslims. What is Islamophobia in Australia, for instance? And um, so they recently, it was published uh, on Australia Day of this year, January 26, the results of the survey. They uh, telephoned or, or personally interviewed uh, nearly a thousand people, uh, was the objective at least. I don't know whether they got that many, but when it was turned into percentages, uh, for instance, 97%, which actually might be higher, 99.5% or something like that, of Australians associate terrorism with Islam. Those are the sorts of the results, uncontroversial results. So that's what SAFER does, uh, amongst other things. And there's a, another group as well, uh, also in your hometown of Adelaide, uh, Concerned Citizens of South Australia, which is, it's, it's a very sort of vague name. What, what are they about specifically? Well, I think it's fair to say that they started off uh, by objecting to a mosque going into their local community. And uh, substantially, they are concerned about that um, when the Paris attacks were on, for instance, and when the, uh, the gay nightclub in um, Orlando. Orlando, yeah, when that massacre was on, they were on the streets on the side, uh, and I was on the side of the road with someone. Uh, then his son was actually a, uh, a drag queen in a nightclub in Adelaide, and he was concerned <coughs> for his own son's welfare. So he wasn't particularly being anti-Islamic. He was just mm. saying, if this is the sort of target that they're allowed to do in Orlando, he's concerned that the nightclub, and I won't mention it in case it makes it a target, um, might be targeted by them too. And so we, so it's an activist group. Yeah, well, that certainly sounds like they were, they were born out of a really uh, deep concern. So that's good that that uh, f father, that's what inspired him. Now, you organised the, the International Freedom of Speech Day in October 6th last year in Lakemba. Uh, now, that was the, the suburb where Lauren Southern, when she was in Australia, she was told to move on when she approached the, the mosque. The, the breach of the peace, that seems to be the sort of go-to thing for to suppress uh, free speech. Uh, now, obviously, it, it was considered by some to be provocative to hold a free speech rally there, which in all reality it shouldn't have been. Were, were, there, were there any threats in the, the lead-up? Did authorities try to deter you at all? Well, uh, let's look at the process that we followed. We spoke with the police. We told them what we were going to do. We told them that they would know who would be the reactors who would cause violence and that they ought to take out an injunction against those people and prevent them from coming near our rally where we were going to have a soapbox where anybody who wanted to could stand up and speak freely. And so we set out to preempt uh, left-wing violence from occurring. And as a result of that, my guess is, but I don't know, my guess is that the police policed in that way and told them not to come. So they didn't come to our rally. And we then chose not to go down to the mosque. Now, when people say that speaking out against a particular ideology is provocative, that means that that ideology has trained them like Pavlov's dog to accept that violence is an acceptable response in Australia to having your ideology criticised in words only, and it's not acceptable. And that's why we have to take the steps that we take to show that we are allowed to speak freely in Australia. And just because I've been threatened with death and just because I've been woken up at night with a gunshot, it's not going to stop me taking to the streets and saying, I'm allowed to do this. I'm allowed to say, you're an idiot if you think a man rode a horse with wings. 
And you also spoke at the, the Free Tommy rallies when he was imprisoned uh, in the middle of, of last year and, and spent roughly two months behind bars for contempt of court for filming outside a, a Muslim gang grooming trial. Now, that uh, contempt of court conviction was, was overturned. Uh, he was originally sentenced to, to 13 months, but now he's going through a, a retrial. Now, drawing on your legal uh, mind, uh, what do you make of this retrial? Uh, is it likely to, because obviously this is another politically charged case, uh, how strong do you think his defence is? There's a, I mean, we could all spend hours talking about what's happened with Tommy and, you know, you've probably read his book as I have and I've read his articles and I've followed him uh, as he has spoken. He was on Today Tonight, I think, in Australia or a few years ago, uh, predicting that the violence that was going on in his hometown of Luton was definitely going to occur in the Australian streets. This is before Martin's Place. And, and so of so forth and before all the Islamic attacks that we've had here in Australia, uh, which people forget about. People say, oh, Islamic terrorism is going to come to Australia. It's already here and happening regularly and they're under surveillance. And, you know, we've had 15 terrorist attacks which have actually come to fruit in Australia. Uh, you know, stabbings and bombings and shootings and so forth. But Tommy predicted all of that. Um, and of course, he gets called a racist for his trouble, but, but which is difficult to understand when more than half his mates of multi, yeah, multi, multi-coloured races. But so, the, here's a question: When he's in custody, and he's transferred to the prison in England, which has the highest Muslim population of prisoners, and then his cell door is accidentally left open, who's getting paid? Someone is getting paid or threatened. If you imagine yourself as a prison guard and some uh, Islamic terrorist and they have track records, we know they'll follow through with their threats and they say, we know where you live. We know where your wife is. We know where your kids are. If you don't leave Tommy's cell door open, this is going to happen to your own kids. Well, what choices do you have? And so it's clear what happens with Tommy. There's a huge amount of corruption involved. We know what happened in Rotherham, where uh, families were reporting what was happening to their kids and getting dismissed for fear that the police would be called, uh, the police were fearful they'd be called racist if they acted against the Islamic sex gangs. So Tommy's not just up against the law, he's after a hot, up against a whole corrupted political system. That's my belief. And, um, you know, who would it happen to that you wouldn't have a trial, but you'd be locked up and within five hours be convicted and sentenced to 13 months jail? Yeah. And they, they went at, over the top there, so over the top that he it was clearly obviously a travesty of justice and he was released. My real concern is one of these either paid corrupt prison officers or someone under terrorist threat acting uh, would have put him in uh, I, I believe Tommy would have died, and I think he will die in prison if he goes to prison again. It's a lot more sinister what is happening in the in the UK. You'd probably have a a lot more work to do if you uh, the the British lawyer in charge of of Tommy's case. Well, there comes a point at which you go, uh, how far can you go with this? You know, uh, we talk about the Lebanese crime gangs in, in Australia because at the time when Lebanon had all that war, we lowered our we lowered our standards of character and let people in who wouldn't ordinarily come in uh, under the character test. Now, that's not because they're Lebanese and it's not because they're Islamic. It's just because we lowered the character test for these people, many of whom were Lebanese and were Islamic. So I don't think it's either racist or against Islam to say that, but the, the bar has been lowered. So we have these Lebanese crime gangs and they're highly organized crime gangs. What can John Bolton do against that? I can't do very much at all, can I? Well, there's a lot of uh, legal precedents which are, are yet to come and we certainly wish you all the best with the, the case before the, the county court, uh, Blair Cottrell's uh, appeal and uh, we certainly value the, the legal contribution that you're uh, making uh, to uh, Australian uh, freedom and, and thanks for chatting with me today. Thanks very much for giving me the opportunity. Obviously, 
we need to get out there as much as we can. One of the surveys, one of the polls that's been done is that the left never actually engaged with what we're saying. No. You know, they, they won't listen to this. They won't listen to reason. They'll just see it's you. They'll just see it's me and they'll switch off because we are racist. Uh, homophobic, xenophobic, uh, Islamophobic, virtually every phobia they can think of is who we are. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay, thanks for that, Tim. And that's the show for today. As I mentioned during the show, we will continue to provide coverage of the Milo Clash trial. John Bolton is Neil Erickson's lawyer. Ricky Turner is the other patriot. He will be represented by a separate legal team. And, of course, we will continue to cover Blair Cottrell's appeal in the county court. Facebook has been engaging in another right-wing purge, deleting the page of Politicalite, a pro-Tommy website in the UK. Thankfully, The Unshackled is still on all the major social media platforms. However, make sure that you open an account and follow us on free speech social media at gab.ai slash the unshackled and at minds.com slash the underscore unshackled and mewe.com slash p slash the unshackled and of course on telegram at t.me slash the unshackled. Remember, we rely on your financial support to continue our work. You can pledge over at patreon.com slash the unshackled or directly via paypal.me slash the unshackled. We also have our premium membership option on our website, theunshackled.net slash support options slash premium membership. Slack Bastard has just opened up a Patreon account, so it's important that there are sites such as the unshackled to counter his influence. It's a Thursday night, so stay tuned for The Uncuckables with myself, David Hiscock, the editor of XYZ, and James Fox Higgins of The Rational Rise. We're going to discuss Australia's clown election that has become lately. So thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next show. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.